experience begins in three, two, one. Now, if you're ready, we will begin. Welcome to the Marla and Dave Radio Show. This is reality radio with a couple that keeps it real. Current events, pop culture, music, relationships, fitness, the hot topics of the day. Marla and Dave Thomas. This is the Marla and Dave Radio Show. Real radio. Turn it up! Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Marla and Dave, Dave Show. Show. We are Marla and Dave. <laughs> that would be us. That's so crazy. That Hence the name, the Marla and Dave Show. It's insane. That's amazing. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, Marlon, Marlon and Dave are a progressive couple who speaks their mind. Um, we are advocates for things in life that matter. Um, we are parents. We are grandparents. And we are um, pretty sexy and sassy, if you ask me. <laughs> That's who we are. But in the meantime... We Gun like control versus mental health. That's what we're going to be talking about today. I actually have a problem with the verses, but after every tragic mass shooting, the conversation turns to gun control versus mental health as a means of keeping it from happening again. Aside from the political maneuvering, which leads to inaction, why can't we work on both issues at the same time? Trump. Today, we'll talk to both law enforcement professionals and a mental health professional to see if we can help stimulate some effective action on this issue. Dave, Or at least understand the issue a little bit better so that we can have a clear understanding on how to actually be effective in our action. Can I talk about something? And I really like the young kids as well from just getting engaged and actually oh, saying, for sure. if you don't un- get with what we're saying, we're voting don't you out. Don't worry about it. You That's even, how you do it. You won't even be in office anymore. So what you thought you were doing, your legislation, it will be for naught because we won't even be listening to you because you won't be our politician. Anyway, um, I, there's a word that jumps out. Um, in And by the way, uh, awesome... Uh, Show tease, Dave. You did a good job. Oh, thank you. Hey, yeah. I almost forgot. Three two three five two four two five nine nine is the number for you to call and to join, join the conversation. conversation. Wow! Well, look at us. All it took was for me to get just one year older, <laughs> and now we're just perfectly in sync. The word that jumps out is stimulate. Stimulate. Ooh, stim- I like that word. Watch this. Stimulate. Mm, red lips. Stimulate. That's, you know why these lips are here? <laughs> By the way, um, I just was talking to our sweetie. Um, we're always appreciative of Tony Sweet. Um, without Tony, there's 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 no mad there's no madhouse. Um, so, but I was telling Tony, I feel like I'm a, a partying Israelite. I've been partying for forty days and forty nights. It's not over. That's a problem. Oh, it's not over. That's a problem. Anyway, I turned fifty on February twenty one, and I am filled with gratitude. My hair is a wreck until tomorrow, so I'm wearing a hat, and so deal with it. Um, It doesn't matter. Focus on my... This is what I tell people in the world. Focus on my nose. (laughs) Had to change your finger because you didn't quite understand. Focus on on my nose because my nose has never changed. It doesn't change. It's the same nose. I can guarantee you unless there's... I've, I've been kidnapped and somebody's doing forced plastic surgery on me, I will never touch my nose. Because my hair changes, right? I was wearing braids. I wear braids again tomorrow. I have my hair rebraided. Um, you know, anytime you see my hair braided down, there's some tropical activity in my near future. Um, and so I've been. I had um, Kia Todd uh, and Jasmine Lewis uh, were instrumental in throwing me a private luncheon, which was incredible. Alvin Chia and and Adria family, um, the baby Moniz and Ad. Um, Nikki, a bunch of people came through, <laughs> including, including me, including Dave. Well, Dave, you're you're like a you're like anyway. A, you're I'll like keep skin. going. Hurry, let's get going. Let's get this thing moving. You're like skin. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I don't name you because you just it's it's a given. You're like you've been stuck to me since we were kids. Hmm. You said it in your own thing. But anyway, I just grateful. And then we turned around and I did a, a bike and brunch. And um, to my surprise, there was a uh, it was an open ended thing. Anyone could come through. Um, we rode from set from Venice to Santa Monica. We almost started taking over brick and mortar. Well, yeah, we went to a, br- a brunch place called Brick and Mortar, which is a hot spot hot in Santa time. Monica. Um, shout out to them. But as to much to my surprise, I have different sets of friends, but the groups can always interact well together. And in walks the crew: Rocky, Whitney, 
um, Crystal and Layla Hathaway. And I said, Layla, what the hell shocked the hell out of me? Because I know she's on tour. She's been one of the hardest working she women. She just got back. I didn't know. Yeah. Because I just saw her in Texas on my feed. So I'm like, wait a minute. What, what are you doing here? She's like, I just got back. And she came to see me. I know she was exhausted. So I was excited about that. All of them. I'm and this is all after coming home from Cabo. And I was in Cabo. So a shout for out to her. actual a, birthday. For my actual birthday. And Dave and Elena McGill, um, who was instrumental in, in, that, in making that whole Cabo thing happen and making it magic. And then on top of that, my cousin Joy, who's my heart. She's like my sister. She and her husband, Vincent, came through to Cabo all the way from Dallas. And then we were there with all the Canadians. And it's, I ain't mate. That's not right. Okay, What's anyway. up? Was that a pirate? <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a. Hey. Hey. <laughs> that's a pirate who needs some help. And you know what? There's a, there's one guy who stood out and we teased, I teased the hell out of him. I wish I could send him some flowers because he became the focus of all my jokes. Shout out to Rooster. Rooster, this is for you. Either Rooster was completely unaware or he's just a great sport. Because you were on Rooster. Rooster, Rooster, his name is Rooster. How am I not supposed to jump on that? Anyway, you know, also uh, DJ's ministry is in full swing. Oh, nice. uh, Marla and I, as and now as our son is preparing to make his transition from Twin Towers back into society, even our DJ is actually joining the advocacy movement for mental health. And uh, Marla, give them the link for uh, DJ's ministry. D- it's paypal.me forward slash DJS DJ's ministry M I N I S T R Y. So it's just that simple. It's right there on the front of our uh, website www.marlandave.com. Here's what I want you guys to know: the more we learn about mental health, the more that we can we be, we've begun to understand how we can actually be effective advocates to help those who suffer. And unfortunately for us, after Ronald Reagan shut down all the mental health uh, facilities. Jail has become a mental health facility. So so where DJ is housed is all misdemeanor offenders, people who are just in psychosis and out of their mind, and they end up in jail. When in they this really program, need a hospital. And that is where they they receive and meds are administered and things of that sort, but they need a hospital. But by the time they get there, most of them have, have their family and their loved ones have abandoned them. For You know, in all reality, it's a hard thing to contend with, even for a loved one. So all it takes, guys, and this is what I was telling somebody, there are several people, like four, who are donating every single solitary week. If each one of those people could just explain the urgency and have three people connected to you that are willing to give $10 a month, you can change the actual life of an inmate that is incarcerated because of mental health issues. We personally manage this ministry by going to the jail and getting the inmate phone numbers and their names and going down to the jail and depositing on each man's account so they can cover their basic needs. Soap, uh, toiletries. Shower shoes. Yes. Uh, food. Basic food. Snacks. Extra food. They're hungry. Phone cards. And phone cards. Things yeah. that The basic things we take for granted, you can literally change somebody's life for $10 a month. So we're just looking for people who will continue to donate. Um, this week, by the way, by Wednesday, we're looking to raise $300 because the new list has 15 people on it and we already have some money from before. So that's exactly what it's going to take. So there's 15 new names, 15 guys that we need to, and I'm leaving town on Thursday. So if we can get it in by Thursday, that would be great. And I can go down to Twin Towers and handle that. But it's, it's paypal.me forward slash DJ's ministry. It's, it's, it's never going to stop. Again, today we're talking about mental health versus gun control in the wake of the Parkland shooting. Tony, hit me with my mood song. Under the sea, under the sea, since life is sweet here, we got to be here naturally. Even the sturgeon and the rain, the earth start to play. We got the spirit, you got to hear it. Under the sea. Anyway, so today Marla and I met with Stacy like Frank to... and Jim Hart oh. uh, of Lionfish University, and we're considering actually Blind joining fish. up Lionfish University. Oh, your tooth sometimes. Lionfish are actually taking over uh, the reefs here in the Atlantic, in the Caribbean, and uh, we're going to help them with some conservation efforts. Look forward to that in the future. Yes, Tony, can you please play my mood song? The power. The power. The power. The power. 
I'm angry. Yeah, a lot of times people consider freedom, and the freedom seems to actually be a code word for actual racism uh, these days because you're not as free to resist uh, sometimes when things need to be resisted, even in your own government. Anyway, uh, what else, Marla? Well, what I'm saying is I believe that we are out of time. Boom. It's time to actually go to the mad g- news. Get to we'll the news. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Marla and Dave Radio Show on the Universal Broadcast Network. Current events, events, pop culture, the hot topics of the day. It's time for Mad News news. on the Marla and Dave Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, Marla and Dave. Okay, I I said a long time ago that I was not going to keep dwelling on uh, Donald Trump when it comes to the news. But this one was just so funny, I had to do it. So, on a serious note, uh, after the Parkland shooting, uh, it comes out. Uh, that there was a officer that it was at the school with that was armed that during the midst of all this did not even rush in and try to handle the situation. And we're going to talk to while, our law enforcement about that. While people later. were getting killed. And then after that, other sheriffs showed up and did not go in. They waited for the police to actually be the ones to go in. In the meantime, could they have saved somebody's lives? Well, Trump was actually talking to uh, uh, the nation's governors Uh, and basically said he would have run in and engaged the shooter, get this, even if he didn't have a gun. He would have just stormed in and did some kind of Maui face and showed his hair and flapped his hair up and down, and suddenly he would have handled the situation, as he said everyone else would. Not unless the gun looked like a vagina, and he would run up in it then, that's for sure. (laughs) Anyway, I thought that was very funny that we know uh, good and well. That, and first of all, he's Donald so disgusting Trump. disgusting to me that I can't even be kind anymore. Donald I'm just Trump, like, just listen for a minute. Uh, Donald Trump oh. actually used the excuse to get out of serving in, in the military at least three times. Uh, and finally saying he had bone spurs so he couldn't actually join the ministry. Yet he would run in to an actor shooter situation. Please. Donald Trump can't even get in his own pants. Have you seen how fat he's getting? Anyway, okay. what does that have to do with anything? I don't know. Anyway, okay, just, so Oprah. Just random hate. <laughs> Oprah was asked uh, while she was on a, a, a promotional tour for A Wrinkle in Time, a movie that she has coming out. She was asked to respond to Donald Trump trying to call her out to run for president or Monique, uh, the actress who was actually in comedian, who actually said that uh, Oprah was one of the big bad actors who actually caused her to be blackballed in Hollywood. And so they asked Oprah. Uh, while she was on this uh, promotional tour, how she would respond. She said, would she respond negatively? She said, no. Anytime someone comes at you with that much negativity, you just, you just rise, rise above, above it. Just Matter of fact, it float right karmically, under you like- it will come down on you to respond in kind. I try to tell that to Marla all the time. So so that she means that you listen. say, so here's the thing. So that means that what you say is that See I'm, about Donald Trump? Listen, see what I was trying to tell you? So you don't respond. I see it differently now. Now I understand your compliment and calling me an asshole. Yeah. Because I'm the ass that the shit falls out of. Okay. And I'm above it, and it falls in the toilet, and it floats away. Because okay. that's the negativity. I see the vision. Hmm. I get it. It's All called right. medication. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the news the other day, we were watching the news, and we look up, and I could not believe it. You've heard of being arrested for drunk driving. Oh, my God. There was a man on here a in horse. California on the freeway who was arrested for drunk riding. He was, ri- dr- he was he on the freeway. Drunk. Got on a, a really good horse, an Arabian, as a matter of fact, and got on the freeway and was arrested for driving while riding his Wh- horse while on the freeway while intoxicated. So he got an RUI. That's what they call it. A riding under the influence. Yeah, is that they really call, is that really? They a really thing? said that on the news. But he got an RUI. <laughs> anyway, that's the mad news. We're going to we'll get back, back to the show. This ain't your mama's radio show. Can you handle the truth? Then get ready for a real radio experience. Real radio experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Marla and Day. All right, listen. Um, I have a tendency to be very high-strung and high-spirited um, about a lot of things. And unfortunately, I'm sorry for whatever passion comes out of me today because this is one of those topics. This is one of those topics because I, I'm, I struggle. I'm not Dave. Dave can keep everything in a nice little logical compartment. I don't, I don't logic beyond common sense very well without bringing my emotion to the table. 
this is where we are right now in this country with this whole subject on both levels, mental health and gun control are so far outrageously out of control that it doesn't make any sense at all. It's it's ass nine. It's stupid that we're not that we're that we're spending our we're spending our money and we're spin, spinning our wheels. And clearly, see, the thing to me is, you know, something's not working when it's just not working. If it keeps happening over and over and over again, it's not flipping working, period. So what we have is a high influx of mental health. And we're going to split this up today because I don't want the mental health leg of this to get the improper focus. Because the truth of the matter is everyone wants to label mental health or crazy people, as people would call it as the people who are just so unwound that they're the ones that are committing these atrocities and blah, blah, blah. Nine times out of 10, it's mentally health that are victimized by crime. It's the other way around. They're not the ones who are, you know, running around. You just, these are. But it does happen both ways. It does, but it's, but it's not the, it's not the majority though. So I I just, we need to put that in the right, but the right, we need to frame that. So then we're, we're in total agreement that it's, it makes no sense to say, gun control versus mental health correct we are we do agree on that because you actually need to do both absolutely um, we, we totally agree on that uh and, and so uh the the problem that i have with a situation like this is that you have a congress and anytime that you get you see the news after one of these mass shootings uh uh for instance after the uh what, what was the one where they uh, shot up the elementary kids elementary school sandy kids, hook, sandy hook uh, we couldn't even get gun control uh, as a serious discussion in Congress then. And it's really because uh, the playbook politically is to let's talk about it for a little while. It'll leave the news cycle and then we can still keep taking money from the NRA uh, to line our pockets as politicians and actually do nothing. Uh, that's the old playbook. Uh, thanks to uh, a very effective tactic by uh, uh, the students there from uh, started there in Parkland, but then students all over the country have actually got together and started marching and saying, if we don't do something about this, trust us. If we're not voting age now, we will be very soon and you will be voted out of office. You know, unfortunately, you know, even that, I, I, I don't know that that's going to have the, the, the effect that I think that they want it to have. Because the bottom line is, the you know why the NRA, you know why this is taking root? Because the NRA has begun to actually, I mean, there are companies, three companies to be exact, who have actually said, okay, well, that's it. We're no longer taking, you're not getting a discount. We're not going to be associated with the NRA anymore. At all, period. And right. so, the, so, the, so the, 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 fun, the discounts and the things that they were given as NRA members are gone. So basically, when it begins to affect their actual pocket, see, it. Yeah, but I, here's where here's where I, I slightly disagree with you on some of those companies. Some of those companies, for them, it makes a good public, publicity t- sense to actually uh, disassociate from the NRA. But the NRA gets its money from gun manufacturers, and that is money that is almost limitless. Well, let me say this, too. Just like the energy uh, uh, lobbyist. We can all see the problem today. We, we hope to get... Um suggestions from all of you as well on the solution by calling the show live during the show at 323-524-2599. We want you to call in. You'll get on the line with us. Um, I know it seems scary from a couple weeks ago, but I'm a loveling, lovey, lovey, lovey girl that just wants you can even call and say happy birthday. We'll sing together. Anyway, give us a call live and, and join our conversation. But back to what we were talking about with the NRA, um, you know, nothing really matters in this in this society um, but money. That, that's just the bottom line. And, and so as I was explaining to a friend today, I said, you know, real power has the ability to create change. If you can't impose a consequence for something th- and that you're speaking out about, then you're just complaining. That's all we're doing. And no one no one is do, no one. Nothing is happening at the behest of the Jesse Jacksons and the Al Sharptons and the they're just in the conversation and in our community, even though they're activists and I appreciate their efforts. What I'm saying to you is it's not going to nothing's going to happen until we can polarize our communities 
and and get our communities to understand that it is the actual what we pay in to society and withdrawing that or withholding that that's going to actually matter we just need to focus what that's going to be so if we truly want to have change if we truly want to make a difference we need to begin to educate ourselves on how it is that we are actually losing our grip with the ability to create change because economically we're whether we know it or not we're funding something we don't want it's like saying oh we hate what's happening to the black community but every time you turn your tv on i've had so many intelligent people that i know say you know what i'm not trying to you know loving hip-hop is a train wreck but for some reason i just you know and i know it's a mess but we turn it on and 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 i'm guilty you turn it on and the next thing you know you're watching something that is completely, well, completely, but but it, it's money. I'm going to have to go back and actually uh, disagree with something that you said, because it seemed like you were saying that uh, money is the reason why um, and power is the reason why some of these things actually don't become effectively dealt with. And I will say this. We have more power in a democracy just as regular citizens than we actually give ourselves credit for because i call it the uh the four cowboys theory four cowboys can take a thousand head of cattle and actually control the cattle and make the cattle do what they want if one one cow basically stood up and said wait this is ridiculous i'm a thousand pounds i'm two thousand pounds i'm twenty five hundred pounds there are a thousand of us there are four guys on a horse hell no it's over the cowboys have no control because they only have perceived power. The government only has perceived power over us as citizens. We can say we're not going to take it. Correct. And the nice the nice way to do it is to say we're not going to take it and we're going to vote you out of office. But we can actually make change today. You're fired now. Except the except the bottom line, Dave. If you if, if it was a strong enough protest, that's all I'm saying. And, and and so now we've had millions of women marching. Which is why I say, what am I getting involved in? What what are we what are we I don't want to just have a temper tantrum. And again, that's why we're gonna have the discussion today with uh, law enforcement professionals, with mental health professionals, because we need to first understand the issue and then we need to actually stay woke. That was a movement as well. Stay woke because we don't need to be lulled to sleep by a, a lot did of times you, I'll be watching did, the news. Did you say stay woke? I said hashtag stay woke. Uh, a lot of times I'll be watching the news and you'll say, well, didn't you just see that already? Didn't you just see that already? And again, we have to stay focused on the issue. We can't allow ourselves to be lulled into complacency and put to sleep by love and, and hip hop. You know, and you know. By uh, housewives or by whatever else is just mindlessly on television. But you know what our problem is, really? Hmm. When, even when you talk about that, you're absolutely correct. But the change that has to be made. So you say, oh, you know, stay woke. People don't wake up until it has a personal effect. Somebody that I know when, when Trump was elected said, oh, and, he, and this person didn't vote, said, oh, come on, Marla. Let's just keep it all the way. Let's just be honest. When has any sitting president had a personal effect on your daily goings and comings in life? I said, until this particular moment, other than, you know, tax reforms and things like that. I mean, a personal impact. I said, never, except this one will. Because it's, 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 there's so much divisiveness and blah, blah, blah. Well, here's the irony. The irony is they all do. You just don't realize it until it's too late. A lot of things that you consider negative might have happened uh, with the last uh, uh, president or with the president before him. It's just now coming into be uh, as we speak. So they all have a, a, a massive impact on your everyday life. I, it I just hear, happens a lot slower than you think. And next thing you know, you're lulled to sleep, just like I said, and something will happen that you say, how, how could this possibly happen? Well, it's because you weren't engaged. Right. That's exactly how it happened. Right. And I'm saying to you that it's it's you know, and, and I'm glad that we're also equally talking about mental health, because I'm also saying to you, until this situation became a critical personal experience, I was not completely awake to the depths of the despair of mental health. I wasn't. So what I'm saying to you is 
until we're personally affected. So so the, that those that community in Parkland, Florida had no reason to be in a rage about non-bipartisan effect or legislation to help fix take assault rifles off the street. The minute exactly. that their and minute that their friends and family and their school and their community had a direct the, it, could, it it's the mentality of oh it, it's it can it's never going to really happen to me and we even look on you know from the distance with compassion and sympathy and empathy for people who are going through but until it punches you in your own face then you're most people are like oh man you know what dang i really hate that marla and dave and and their family are going through this but until you so with that with that logic and if you take that conversation that uh, the line of conversation that you're on right now then nothing's going to happen this time either right That's because what technically only that community was punched in the gut this time well but like i said if if it's 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 to me in this particular case it's an accumulative effect well, so one this, of the- because it keeps happening and everyone's getting tired of it happening and so they're going to use this the, it's like saturation to me the to me parkland is the tipping point sometimes you 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 fill up the thing and you fill up the thing you remember the bobble thing it would do like this and then it would finally get enough liquid in it and it would just go uh, boop, and it would dip up i, I didn't dip know over. you were that that old enough in the I'm 70s 50. to actually recognize 50 that. everybody i'm 50 <laughs> you know how you beat somebody to the punch you can't call me old because i call myself old i'm 50 what Anyway, it, 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 one of the things that I really want to ask our, our law enforcement uh, professional um, when we actually speak to him today is this whole idea of putting more guns uh, just, into the hands of the public whew. in order to handle issues like this. First of all, uh, they, they had a discussion and there was an interview with one of the teachers. Uh, first of all, they have uh, teachers who are armed in Texas right now. Uh, and they train them uh, with, uh, you know, situations like this, but they don't train them in these types of scenarios. So there was another lady who said, would you be willing to have a gun in this situation? She said, no. She said, because I'm glad that I wasn't there. This is one of the teachers from Texas basically saying, because of the way the police and law enforcement usually storms in, when they storm in, they're pretty on, their nerves are on edge as well. Right. So they're... Very Whoever has the gun gets, gets, gets shot and killed. Heightened reflexes, and it takes a, a lot of training, uh, and I'm going to talk about the training as well, to actually be able to control yourself with that much adrenaline rushing through your rushing through your veins. She said she might have been hiding behind something and just jumped up with her gun. The police would have shot her instantly. She would have gotten shot. Or, or she might be so afraid when the police... Uh, burst through the door she might have accidentally started pulling off shooting off rounds at the police herself by mistake because she's not trained to handle this type of right. scenario she's not trained to, to fire in a crisis situation like that and even when you are trained when the rubber actually meets the road and it actually goes down you'll never know what you will do i.e you have pol- uh, a law enforcement officials that were armed that were supposedly trained to do this that did not run and into I, the school and i know why they didn't by the way i know why he did not it's scary not even that because, because let's be real it's scary because you're not equally armed you're not equally armed this kid had an nr15 that is an actual okay. that weapon so let me let me break it down i do know uh, uh law enforcement officials as as do you who will go in with whatever they're armed with because that's just their makeup everybody doesn't have the same makeup even and, though we might have the same job you might not actually be as brave as the guy standing but, next but to you but they're but they're but they're they're you're talking about a sharpshooter we know that that's what they're prepared to do they're prepared exactly. to kill you so, and, and he's prepared to put himself in danger in order to get the job done right but that's swat Let's just yeah, get that. In other this words, is, it's a special tactic. But that's team. what I mean. He, they are trained. SWAT is trained sure. to actually go, walk right into to, danger to a head first, crisis. with the understanding that I don't care what you're shooting. I'm a better shot than you are. Right. Not every police uh, person or law enforcement professional has that same training G- as a SWAT. Gina Mitchell. Gina Mitchell um, Sims is says the Second Amendment protects a right to own a gun. We need to get that one clear. You have no constitutional right to carry a concealed weapon. The Second Amendment delineates a right to keep and hear. Hold on. The right to keep and And bear. bear, I'm sorry. Arms inside your home 
for for protection of yourself and your family. This right does not extend to the streets of any metropol- metropolitan or me- metropolis, rather. Which is the ridiculousness of that line of thinking and the line of, and the way that they answer the question Wait, with that answer. She says that it literally stops at your front door inside your domain. The rule of thumb is and has been skewed and bastardized beyond its precepts. We got to get it straight. Just like we have controls on free speech. You can't say anything you want to anyone under any circumstance, even though. Shut the hell up, That babe. is our very first. I'm just going to try it. Uh, that's our very first freedom that we protect is free speech. Did you hear what I told you? Okay, no, I didn't hear that because you don't have the right to say that to me. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but we, 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 we value free speech, but there's such a thing as slander. And right. you can be sued for it right. and lose your money. Yeah, it's, yeah. We have, have to, control on speech, just like we need control on, on the freedom and the right to bear arms. And again, welcome. And we need to enforce those controls. Welcome everybody who's joining the Madhouse. Some of our old faves are here. Uh, Gordon, welcome. Luana, Henderson, Cordelia, um, Gina. For those who are on Periscope, just want to just encourage everybody because the conversations happen all over, including the chat room. Are we still on Periscope? We Periscope, know, Periscope is still real? Peris- wow. Periscope. I haven't heard of Periscope in forever. UBN Radio TV. <laughs> you know, you were never on it. That's true. You were. For both of us. Thank you, by the way. No, I'm gone. Anyway, uh, uh, so we, 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 we can go all day on the gun control issue because it makes no sense. But the thing that most people don't realize is the mental health side of it is equally as important. Matter of fact, it might be more important. Yeah, well, because um, people who are balanced don't necessarily get themselves into that's not what you do like in other words first of all anybody who one of the characteristics that has to happen just with our education and personal experience which a lot of our unfortunate a lot of our mental health education is is due to unfortunate circumstances that we've dealt with in our family but what we do know is that when you're in a particular state of mind you can't even get to that point without um uh, being dissociative you have to dissociate yourself disconnect completely from um wh- whatever the issue is to be able to even carry that out and by the way you've been dwelling on that mo- mofo situation and plan for a long time it's incessant it's like running water because that's how their brain is actually working the way the way i look at it is had he received the proper mental health help that he needed this whole situation would have been averted. Had he not been able to get his hands on the weaponry, the situation could have also been averted. So we need to do all that we can, not just as le- the, the least amount that we can to address this issue. Anyway, we're talking mental health versus gun control. We shall be right back on the Marlon Dave Show. Hey, guys. Listen up. Learn something. 26 years of marriage from two unique perspectives equals 52 years of relationship experience. It's time for Ask Marla and Dave. Answers to your questions about life, love, and relationship based on Marla and Dave's real life experience. It's about to get real. Ask Marla and Dave. Dave. All right, the Ask Marla and Dave uh, segment of the show is where you have gone to our home, www.marlandave.com, clicked on the Ask Marla and Dave tab, and submitted your question, which goes right straight through to this portion of the show, and we actually answer it, deal with it right here. The question this week is uh, from Desperate. It says, I've been watching Marla's social media posting of your journey with your son. My daughter is diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and she frequently becomes violent. How do I maintain a loving relationship and protect myself and the rest of the family from her violent episodes. I'm a single mother with two other children. The youngest is only nine years old. Again, signed, Desperate. Marla, go. Um, I wish I knew what age this child was, obviously uh, one of the older. But what I will say is this. Number one, first and foremost, always now that we've been on this journey, join NAMI. Do it today. Do it right now. Get, get online and join this NAMI. The local chapter the whatever, for NAMI. Just look up NAMI and find the nearest NAMI to you and join because NAMI is going to be. N-A-M-I, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. It's going to be your greatest resource um, possible. The next thing is, you know, there's a word that is in here, which is, you know, how do I maintain a loving relationship? I have found indirectly that, you know, for our son and his, his journey, love has been the saving grace. 
So you are going to have to, safety comes first. Um, you're going to have to let, you know, you, you're going to have to continue to tell your loved one that's suffering, hey, I know that you're, I, I'm, I'm aware, I understand what you're going through, and I know that, you know, you're having a hard time, but this is what's, this is what's going to have to happen because I can't, I can't help you in this particular situation. You know, we're not equipped to do what we need to do because we're not doctors and we don't have the ability to actually reverse or to manage the mental health crisis and episodes of our loved ones. And I to add to what Marla is saying, uh, you can only love yourself, uh, love somebody else as you love yourself. And safety must come first. To take care of yourself allows you to be in a position to take care of your other two kids as well as uh, um, uh, your daughter who is dealing with the mental health challenges. And on top of that, sometimes you have to take the extra step and just call the police and actually get the safety issue uh, under control before you can actually go on with some of the other uh, challenges but that the, you're going to face. But the one thing I've learned is that that boundary, love, is doesn't come. It, it's a totally separate thing, and it should never leave the table. And the NAMI information is right there on our website, www.marlindave.com. This is a very serious issue to us. We're we, going to get back to the show. We hope we answered your question, Desperate. Intelligent. Fun. And super real. This is the Marla and Dave Radio Show. All right. And during this segment of the show, we're actually going to speak with a law enforcement professional, uh, Daryl Smith. From he's Baltimore. a he's a, a, a mad family friend. Uh, and we're going to get him on the line as soon as we can. Yes. So we're going to we're going to call him. And while we're calling him, um, Lawana Henderson is, is also um, on our feed on the Facebook. We're streaming live there. Um, and she says, I desire to make another. Oh, she's talking about making a contribution. By all means, please. Um, and share it with your friends. Get three friends to commit to $10 a month and we'll be killing it. Um, Luana Henderson says, hey, guys, I'm listening. And, yes, the mental health side is truly as equally important. So glad that you're talking about this. We want to welcome back to the to the madhouse um, our friend. You know what? I'm now calling him our mad law enforcement specialist. He belongs to us. We want to welcome Daryl Dar- Smith um, to the madhouse. Welcome, Daryl. Daryl, what's going on, buddy? Well, thank you for having me. So, um, so right there, first of all, uh, being an officer in the Baltimore area, you are not um, unfamiliar uh, with the way that guns affect the community in a negative way. And I, and I, before we even go there, I want you to introduce your own self and your title and what it is that, you, you know, make yourself familiar to our audience. Um, so I'm a sergeant with Baltimore City Police Department, and I've been working there for a little over 23 years. Dang, dude, you're old as hell. You're, <laughs> you're, you're, Almost you're, as old as you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so go ahead, Dave. Uh, I was saying that uh, um, uh, with the Fre- Freddie Gray issue that happened in that area and other things, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar how guns can actually negatively affect the community. Absolutely. Um, you know, for starters, I think the... Um, NRA and folks who support their way of thinking is taking the Second Amendment way out of context. Hmm. I think it's fine to have a weapon, handgun, shotgun, rifle, if you want to go hunting, deer hunting, target practicing, and so forth. But all of the assault weapons that we have now, I don't think the forefathers ever envisioned that regular citizens um, had weapons um, of that caliber. Well, I'm going to ask you this, and this this is not to cut you off, but this is the point blank, just straightforward question. Does it make your job easier or harder knowing that uh, as you go to handle a situation, there could be other guns just in the crowd? Oh, absolutely harder. Much, much harder. And uh, like I was saying, assault weapons were made for a weapon of war to kill as many people in the least amount of time as possible. And and to kill. Citizens, for citizens just to have weapons like that, it's almost ludicrous. Matter of fact, let me ask you this. As a, as a, as a police officer, 
a, a, a sergeant there, do you actually, do you guys go in with assault rifles in uh, many situations yeah. to handle uh, things that you're called out for? No, not, uh, not, not typically. We don't, uh, just carry assault weapons as our, um, part of our regular, um, equipment. So what, so now, what, so some, go ahead. No, I was going to say there's some officers who have gone through uh, a rifle program and they do have those type of weapons, but for an emergency situation, such as what took place in Florida, mm -hmm. Columbine, things of, uh, that nature so when you head out for just an an, an average everyday um beat on the street what would what would a, what would an officer generally in the way of firearms carry what what firepower would you be packing on um, on our department it's a handgun and the weapon of choice is a block uh 40 caliber um but and uh we we carry typically uh, one magazine uh, that the weapon is loaded with, and then we have two uh, two additional uh, magazines on our gun belt. And okay, so good because I, I well, so in, and in that scenario, that would make it. So does that explain? And this is going to be another line of questioning that I know is going to be a little weird because I want to first before I even go there. Let me ask you this. Um, uh, I, I know that's your opinion on um, as a professional um, as to what guns should be allowed in the public. But is there a gradient as to some of the other officers that you work on that might say, hey, yeah, you should have as many guns as you want. Are there policemen that you know that support uh, right. uh, the same uh, 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 efforts that the NRA seems to be promoting? Absolutely. One hundred percent. And there are those who are workers who are gun collectors. Um and they have uh, a number of weapons themselves, including AR-15s and those type of uh, weapons. And they believe that the Second Amendment is to include not only handguns, shotguns, and rifles, but uh, assault weapons as well. Hmm. So, and they would have no problem then just rushing in with someone who has a, is armed with the AR-15 when they're armed with the a, a, a handgun, a Glock, a Fort, a Glock forty. Well, that's that's a whole different ball game because going in with a handgun against someone who has an AR fifteen, it's like almost like bringing a knife to a gun battle. So, and that's what I was going to ask. So, you talked about you know carrying a Glock, which is a forty caliber gun, which which discharges you know one bullet at what particular rate, and even before, I don't even need that answer. How much damage? can you do what tell us the difference between a shot to a human body between the rifle the, the ar-15 yeah the the, the ar-15 and the 40 caliber handgun. the handgun well i mean just keep in mind though it doesn't matter what type of weapon it is if you strike a person in uh the correct place uh, damage will be done um but if you want a comparative value, I don't know the specific velocity that the AR-15 round uh, produces, but it's significantly faster. And, for instance, my the type of weapon I carry, if you're wearing body armor, and as long as you're not utilizing armor-piercing bullets, um, our vests will protect us. But with an AR-15... It's traveling too fast, and hmm. it's almost as if you didn't even have it. If you had a vest on, it's as if you didn't have one because the vest would not um, protect you. Wow. H hence carrying useless. the knife to the gunfight analogy. Got a phone call? Absolutely. Uh, so let me ask you this. Um, so what do you think and how do other law enforcement professionals uh, deal with the concept that uh, there were law enforcement professionals on the scene that did not rush in to actually handle the situation. Well, I, I'm never going to judge um, another officer. That's fair. For That's what fair. He did do or did not do, um, especially when I wasn't there. Right. Um, I've heard reports that they told the officers. 
um, the dispatcher or those on the radio were saying, wait for backup, uh, stand by for, um, for the tactical units to arrive. You don't know what information they received, so mm. I'm not going to be quick to uh, judge the officers for running into the school or not running into the school. Um, because I don't have all the facts. Now, so then, in in light of that, then would it be irresponsible for some for a politician to, uh, let's just say, say that I would just I would rush in and I would have no problem rushing in if I had a gun. I'd even rush in if I didn't have a gun. Basically, what we're saying is Donald Trump said that he would just go in <laughs> and shoot shoot the person and they'd be dead. Well, well, Donald Trump wouldn't go in, and we all know. Well, most of us know that. What Donald Trump says out of his mouth is neither here nor there. Um, so, the, you, but, you, but, you it's, would, but it's interesting. You would hope in that situation that we, and when I say we, I mean members of the law enforcement community would go in and do the right thing and save the day. But you also have to remember if the officer would have rushed in and say a student would have been shot by that officer in trying to uh, subdue the perpetrator, the, uh, perpetrator then we may be talking He'd be crucified about for that, yeah. Wait. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, what? I, But what I gather from what you're saying is then there could be a situation where those officers were actually following a protocol or following orders, uh, which would be the reason that they did not actually rush in. I, right, that's I think that's inconsequential. Possible. To be totally honest, I mean, th- the bottom line is exactly when you're listening to what, what Daryl is saying, you know, you're talking about being ill-equipped, period. Unless you're trained, or in, in some cases, there are those who just... Which is which is my which, next question. Right. Are, are, are all law enforcement uh, uh, responders, first responders, trained in scenarios like what happened in Parkland, like what happened in Sandy Hook, like what happened in Columbine? Well, I know in our department in the last few years, they have trained us um, as far as active shooter uh, scenarios and so forth. I don't know how each department across the country, if they're up to speed on that. Um, I would think so. You would hope so um, because of all the situations that have taken place. Hmm. Um, but I'm not sure exactly to uh, what degree those deputies were were trained well the the other thing you know uh daryl i want to ask you um have you ever seen the effects of an assault rifle used on someone in real life in the street just on the beat in 24 years have you seen that i have seen the effects um and it does quite a bit of damage unfortunately one shot with the handgun, you could be rendered dead, so you can't get more dead. Right. But I know the I've seen the effects of someone shot with an assault rifle, and I mean it's not a pretty sight, and the person really doesn't have much of a chance. I was I was gonna say I wonder if there's any survivors who uh, survivors who've taken direct hits from an actual assault weapon. It sounds like rarely, if ever according to some things I was reading, that it's just the velocity of the difference is you don't really have a fighting chance because it explodes everything in its path and it shatters from the place of strike. It's like a it's like a resonating um, effect. I, I, I hate to say a cassava melon, but it kind of just burst. Everything that, that the bullet passes, it's not like it just penetrates an organ. It blows it up. Well, Daryl, yeah, uh, first of all, I... He's about I, to say something. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, I was going to say real real quick, and you also have to keep in mind that the uh, the velocity and distance that that bullet is traveling, you know, bullets don't have a name on it. And you may hit the intended target, but you're spraying so many bullets in a short amount of time. You also have to worry about the uh, collateral damage that is done hmm. on innocent people. Um, and and the effects that that also causes. So that's something else to keep in mind. Well, I want to actually turn the corner from the gun uh, 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 part aspect of this whole situation and ask 
Um, how often are the law enforcement officers and professionals um, uh, that you've dealt with, how often are they trained in dealing with mental health issues and things of that nature? We go through uh, yearly training. It's called uh, in-service training, uh, which is required as a mandate. Uh, and so we have uh, classroom work um, dealing with that and different scenarios. Um, so it's, it's it's once a year. And, um, and how does that? And how does that? I mean, d- right quick, does that? Are you? Does it teach you the difference to, when you're on the on the beat? Do you know immediately the difference, or and how is that handled? So, in other words, do you treat a perpetrator differently if you feel like that they're affected by mental illness outside of the basic safety issues? That I mean, because it's clear that if if something if he's is, shooting, then he's yeah. Shooting. I mean, yeah. I mean, mentally ill or not, if somebody's in danger, you have to you know deal with it. All right. Uh, we'll we'll have calls um, that are um, entitled behavioral crisis. And if, if that's the case, of course, we send more than just one officer for safety. And there are some tools and tactics that we use as far as trying to get the person to calm down instead of yelling at the person and, and, and multiple officers talking to the person at one time, which just creates a lot of tension and confusion. Mm-hmm. Just one, um, one officer uh, engaging a particular individual just speaking in uh, a calm tone if the situation warrants that and just trying to uh, get the person to realize that the police are there, but they're to help them, not to hurt them. So as a law enforcement officer who's trained to protect and serve, um, there's been several things that have been brought to the table um, as a solution to this crisis that we are definitely in. I don't care what anybody says, we're in a crisis. Um, what would be a solution? One of the things on the table is give the teachers guns. The other thing that was suggested um, that came out of, out of Washington was that we should begin to hire ex-military uh, military. to become teachers who are trained to shoot and kill. What do you think would be the right step um, to begin to uh, to literally address this crisis from a standpoint of law enforcement? Just as somebody who's I mean, versed. <clears throat> I mean, everybody is entitled to their own opinion, those inside the law enforcement community as well as those outside of the law enforcement community. But my perspective is to arm teachers will create more danger um, than currently exists. Um, You may have a situation where a teacher gets into an argument with a student, a couple of students, and say that teacher is attacked by uh, a few students and the, the, that weapon is removed from that teacher, you have a different situation in your hands right then and there. Um, you're going to require teachers to not only go through their whatever annual certifications they need to deal with, now they have to worry about being trained in firearms, uh, safety, and going through that training, and Teachers, if, if a potential situation like what took place in Florida happens and the teacher is trying to protect the school and, and officers rush into the school and they see a teacher armed with a gun, um, the officer may not be able to and probably won't be able to differentiate between mm-hmm. who is the teacher and who is the suspect. Okay. That creates more of a dangerous Dar- situation. Dar- there, Dar- and I can go on and on and Dar- on. Dar- Daryl, can you hold on? We because we, we wanna we wanna we wanna close with you, but can you just hang in with us right quick through this break and we'll be right back? You got it. All right. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you. We're talking to Daryl Smith uh on the Marlon Dave show. We'll be right back. It's time for the Marla and Dave Doghouse. Marla has something that should put Dave in the doghouse. Dave has something that should put Marla in the doghouse. You decide who gets a biscuit and who gets busted and ends up in the doghouse. You know what, David? It's rare, very rare that I'm going to bring a um, a sexual uh, uh, a sexual situation against you for the doghouse, but. What? I am. So, you know, you are a touchy-feely, gropey, sticky, 
you know, pokey kind of guy. You know, you just want to <laughs> constantly be poking in me uh, and around wow. me. Let's just at say, all wow. Times. It's true, Dave, until I'm like, ah! So today I decided that I was going to turn the tables and I just ran around and just began to, you know, simulate sexual assault on you all and on all day long until finally you were like, Marla. Me too. No. <laughs> just, I didn't say that though. But you were like, Marla, would you please stop? And I said, isn't this what you do? So what I'm saying is what's good for the goose is clearly not good for the gander. So maybe, you know, you should strap it down. Well, and the reason why Marla is going in the donk house today, because, yes, all that is true. And Marla did do that. And, he, and initially I was like, Marla, because she, I thought she was just, you know, just taking it too far. But then I said, oh, you know what? I get what this is coming from. And you're right. I do do that. And I just turned around. I started to accept it. And all of a sudden, then you wanted to stop. You weren't accepting it. You chased me. I had to jump up on the bed, Tony. I was running around like parkour. Because I said, me too. Okay, see? See? <laughs> get in the doghouse. Do you have a doghouse offense? <laughs> and that doesn't diminish the me you too You know what? You movement. better just be quiet That's right now. That's just a joke. I, I apologize. So maybe I do go in the doghouse. You're going house. in the doghouse for just, just being an ass. <laughs> He's anyway, in the doghouse backwards. Let's get back to the show. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the action? You'll laugh. <laughs> You'll learn. Uh -huh. You'll learn. Mm -hmm. You'll get mad. Shut up. You'll get happy. <laughs> but you won't be bored. <laughs> this is the Marla and Dave Radio Show on the Universal Broadcast Network. All right, we're still speaking with Daryl Smith, law enforcement professional there in the Baltimore, uh, D.C. area. Daryl, you think it would be an overreaction if I just, you know, uh, popped a little small cap in Dave's ass the next time he tries to... I, I think that would be a little bit of an overreaction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It would be definite doghouse offense. That's what, but he has booty meat should be meant to absorb. You know, it's going to be a single shot in hand. It's not anyway. Kevlar. <laughs> anyway, so uh, right quick, Daryl, before we let you go, I want to ask this question. Do you see a rise in the mental health uh, or uh, in mental illness calls that, but that you guys are having to be called out for? I, I, yes, I will say that I do see a rise in it, but I also um, think that our department is doing a good job as far as training is concerned to recognize it because I know in years past um, a behavioral crisis um, situation, you often would think that it's just a suspect who wants to be combative, who wants to... Uh, engage the police for whatever reason and they would have been dealt with um in a total different manner and, and one example uh, i won't give the names of the situation and i had an officer respond out and he had an individual who had a knife and the uh, person he didn't approach the officer but he threatened the officer and his family was on the scene and indicated that he suffered from um, some type of uh, bipolar schizophrenic um, right. disorder. He, was, yeah. he had a mental affliction, right, mental health. He right, was a, right. And, and the officer, instead of, I know in years past, the individual may have been shot because of the, uh, the knife that he had and mm -hmm. he's not complying with the officer's orders and uh, some other things that took place. But the officer... Um, was very calm, talked to the individual, got the individual to not only sit down, but put the knife down. By that time, several of us arrived on the scene. Instead of aggravating the, the uh, situation um, and thinking that this is just a person who uh, wanted to be a badass, for, for lack of a, a better term, um, he was taken into custody and taken to the hospital uh, uh, for treatment. Hmm. And it ended in a quite a, a peaceful manner where, you know, without the particular training that we had, it may have ended uh, in a total different manner. Hmm. Well, that, thank God for that. So, so um, in the last question, do you think that, more training is needed or you guys were adequately trained to handle the, the mental health calls? I think you can, I, I don't ever want to say that we have enough training mm -hmm. um, and additional training is always 
are welcome. They could always help. Um, because it's tough when you go into certain situations and people are dealing with um, mental crisis or, or going through a mental crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing the officer has to take in mind is his safety, her safety, mm -hmm. and the safety of the public around them. But in addition to that, you want to think about the individual and try to understand what they are going through and what's causing them to behave in the way uh, that they are. And so, you know, as we see things on the streets that correspond to the training that we have, um, we can stay, I guess, calmer a little longer mm -hmm. and try to resolve the matter in a more peaceful manner um, as best we can. Well, that's appreciated uh, for sure. And the other thing for me is I'm glad to hear hmm. that because you we are still talking about first responders, you know, and it seems to me that with the situation we've been in with our son, you know, I call family first responders, but we have no platform. So no one's hearing us until it gets to the police and the police, unfortunately, are, for, are forced at this point in dealing with mental health to shuttle mental health into jail. So it's criminal. But the saddest part about it, and I'm just going to say this because, you know, it it really makes me mad. But it was brought up at the, our last NAMI meeting, and I want to say it here. It, mental health to date is the only illness that you can have where you are arrested and not actually treated. In other words, mental health's first instinct is criminal. And you do not go to jail when you're diagnosed with cancer. They don't say, oh, well, my God, you've got pancreatic cancer. You put you in handcuffs. And take you to jail. They don't do it when you have diabetes. They don't do it when you have heart defects. But when you have something that is amiss with your brain, you go to jail because it causes the effect of the things that are happening. But we're not the where it should be treated. We're not buying into that. We're not paying into that. We're basically not even paying attention to it. We're ignoring it. And it's disgusting to me. I cried my eyes out to think that these 17 kids or the four, 15 kids and the two teachers died in parkland because this kid was had every red flag was waving at full mass and it was mm. ignored his his parents his father died when he was five his mother had died recently um he had gone on websites and said i'm gonna be a professional school shooter and then had been treated by the mental health community and like our son prematurely released without being properly treated all the way to something that could be rest, uh, um, restorative. So to me, we need to help. We as people need to stand up and deal with this so we can help um, Daryl and, and any other law enforcement officer because the weight, it's almost like what we've done in our schools. We've turned our back on what really needs to be done, and they're actually doing, they should be the people who come in and shine the brass. But in reality, we're, actually, we're asking them to, to heat the brass, shape the brass, and shine the brass because we've dropped the ball. And protect your ass. And, so, uh, Daryl, in, oh, in light of what Marla is saying, we just want to say, first of all, thank you for your service uh, 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 to the community at large. Also, thank you for being a mad family friend, and thank you for talking to us can, today. Can I also just ask, since I'm throwing caps at asses, Daryl, do you want to talk, yes, talk about the antenna or do you not? Do you want to just let that go? <laughs> you want you want, do you want to talk about well, we'll let that go <laughs> anyway Darryl, thanks again for talking thank to you us so today, much thank for, you. for joining us your 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 uh information is incredible is so needed um i'm glad that you took the time to share with us and everybody all of our listeners thanks Harry, for dave and marla love you much thank thanks you for stopping by you too all right, so, man, that was uh, amazing. Amazing. A uh, lot of information there. We also are going to speak with a mental health professional, and we don't have to look very far. You know what? It's true. My own Marlene. Can we please call Marlene and on the phone? And those of you who know my mother as my mother, it's true. But she's a little smarty, sassy pants who knows a lot about mental health. Hey, sassy pants, this is your daughter. How okay. are you, pumpkin? Uh, okay. This is my relationship with my mother. If I want to, I'm sorry, you're right. You guys are, you, you guys are, woo, you own one tonight. Listen, queen sassy pants. Is that better? Okay, Mimi, uh, first <laughs> of all, again, welcome back to the show. 
Um, and, and for those of you who don't know, um, uh, Marla's mom is not just my mom. Uh, Marlene has been a mental health professional uh, for many years and worked many years at the VA in the mental health uh, facility there, as well as other yeah. hospitals uh, and locations. Um, my me- mother is a chief executive nurse, Dave. You need to say what she is, okay? Because it's it really deep. Hey, mom, I got it. I got him together, girl. <laughs> he's you're, he's good. Keep going. Uh, as you see, so Mimi, how would you dis- de-escalate Marla right now? That might be the first question. <laughs> Good luck on that one. Uh, but so Mimi, in, in light of the whole situation with the mass shootings uh, becoming so, it, it's un- unfortunately it's becoming commonplace, uh, the latest being Parkland uh, of Florida. Um, how do those in the mental health profession look at a situation like this? Is the is the shooter who is victimizing uh, so many people is he also a victim? And how 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 is that looked at uh, from a mental health perspective? Well, <clears throat> yeah, he he is a victim, and the the mental health. <clears throat> the the medical side of it, you know, in an effort, I mean, they they were totally confused. They failed him and they failed the public hmm. because I don't know if people know, but, you know, when you go to a psychiatrist, everything you do and say is supposed to be totally confidential. Mm-hmm. However, when there is some idea that there is harm to a family member, public, whatever. Or self. There is, yes, th- well, not self, but others. There's a duty to report. And I say not self because self, they, the psychiatrist has a duty to act. To make sure that the client, the the person is safe. I mean, he himself or she has to take action to make sure that the person is safe. But everything failed. He that psychiatrist. I don't know if it's a woman or a man. They had the they had uh, an obligation to. Um, it's called Tarasoff. They had an obligation to notify. Well, Mimi, in a situation a pair- like that, we know uh, in the way that we've dealt with our own son, DJ, uh, in some of the crisis that he's been through, uh, it seemed like it's very difficult to get the police to take it as seriously right. as, as, we, know it as to be. we would like them to take it in situations like this. So to me, I can almost see, yeah, you could report, but if nothing actually happened, I, I I would be reluctant to believe that the police would actually do something uh, that aggressive as to take him into custody when he hasn't actually done anything yet, just because you said he has that proclivity. Yes, but you see, because he did make it known that he had that propensity, at that particular time, he was supposed to be put on a legal hold. Just with the threat. Anytime there's a threat to others or self, and it was done to a professional, he should have been put on a on a 72 hour hold at that particular time. Immediately, and and the system failed him. Well, now, uh, so how how widespread is this level of failure? Because as we again, as as with the experience with our own family. Um, we find that it seems like sometimes uh, law enforcement professionals and even uh, mental health professionals would like to respond, but there's not even beds uh, in order to house right. somebody. Uh, so then we have to start saying who is the most dangerous at, at today, right. and, so we can deal with this and, and then not and put off to later something else. And, and by the time we, the system seems overwhelmed, by the time we get to it, in most cases. It, the atrocity has already been committed. And it's, it's too late. And then we say that the system has failed. But what happens is when a formal threat is made like that, they will make space. But the problem is they won't hold the, patient, hold the person long enough 
to truly to, treat to do them. Do anything? I mean, that's what I was gonna say. They, what happens in a seventy-two hour hold? Tell me. T- okay, so let's just say this. Let's just say, oh, I hear you. Okay, I'm gonna initiate a seventy-two hour hold. What is a seventy-two hour hold? What happens to a mentally health, a mental ill um, person or patient during a seventy-two hour hold traditionally? Okay, what happens is traditionally they can force medication, force you to take medication during that time, which they usually do. But in public hospitals, the minute you begin to clear up or as soon as you say, you're no longer a threat. I mean, and so your word is taken at that point Hmm. and out you go. So they're not really rehabilitating or or getting somebody to a point where they they've been restored. It's more of a just of a immediate de-escalation. Yeah, it's a way. It's it's just a holding facility in a public facility. That's what that's what happens. And so so we uh, in our last segment we were speaking to uh, Daryl Smith, a law enforcement uh, professional officer there in the Baltimore area, and we were speaking to him about. Uh, uh, the training that they have with these types of issues and could they use more training? And, and he said, of course, they can use more training uh, because as these situations seem to uh, become more commonplace, uh, you, you, you can never uh, have too much education on how to deal with a situation like this. From a mental health perspective, what more could be done from your perspective uh, to help mitigate some of these situations? That the training that they that they get, keep in mind, just has to do with apprehension and turnover. Uh, I mean, to put it simply, their training um, will help them respond sooner, know what they're know what they're looking at, and be able to take the person to the to the nearest hospital or the 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 first available bed. See, right now, when they, when you call them, many times they won't take the person to uh, something mental health. That's where their training would come in. Mm -hmm. They take them to jail. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to assure that they go to a mental health, well, even you can't assure them, but that call has to be accompanied by the PET team, which stands for the psychiatric evaluation team. It takes forever. There are only a few people around. And so therefore the person that's mentally ill gets caught in the system. And so to jail, they go. Mm. And as we, as we, as we well know. So uh, if we were to say, what would be your, your assessment of at least a best guess as 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 possible to deal with this situation in a more effective yeah, way. I was going to say if you could just if you could it, being the professional that you are if you could give us uh in li- in order of priority one two three steps one two and three one I would do this okay, two I would so, do this three to begin to shift and change the system what would it be? Okay, so you know my way as terrible as it sounds the money. The money that um, needs to be amassed at this particular point, the jail right now is your largest mental health facility. Right. And so what I would suggest is to enlarge the, those facilities and equip those facilities with the best. And to ha- when a, a person is apprehended, to have the police take the person directly to that facility to be evaluated and treated. And then you wouldn't have the risk of the person going to a hospital and release in three days and the cycle starts all over again and you're back at the same risk. I think, uh, and to leave it right there, um, uh, Mimi, first of all, thank you so much for being willing to speak to us today on the show. But I think you hit something on the head um, th- to be able to put a tariff just like they do on gasoline. There are certain taxes that have to go in place to even have a to, to buy gas that actually protects some of the environment and protects some of these other things. There should be a tariff on the sale of weapons. 
that money that the NRA is lobbying for, some of that money from the gun manufacturers should automatically be used That's a good uh, idea. to fund mental health uh, facilities. Redirection of funds. Redirection of funds. Ab- absolutely. Because they're just in a place like Los Angeles. There will never be enough beds. And it, it's strictly Mom, for crisis. Don't go anywhere. Hold yes. on. We'll, we'll bring you back after the break. We'll be right back. Okay. It's time to play the Marla and Dave love game. Here are Marla and Dave to explain how it works. Man, it's hard to be playing games with this kind of conversation that we have today. But this is the uh, the section of the show, the portion of the show, the segment of the show where we actually play the mad love game. Tony, like, after what I've been through, there should be a category called humping. Yeah. A, a game created by Marla and me. It has the three categories that we think most affect relationships, and that's communication, finance, and sex. It's played by rolling a single die. That Marla, you roll the die today. I'm you know gonna what? Reach over there. Tony, you know please. what? You know what, Tony? I don't think that he understands that as every part of me got to be 50. My back is, you know, old and, you know, I'm going to need some extra and support. And you know how they say on the birthdays, we're going to wish you 50 more. Okay. It says sex. Damn it. It says sex. That's my dice. I can't get away. Anyway, Help me. Uh, I better stop lost. Uh... Here's a question for you, and Marlon, this is good. I can, I can direct this at you. Which sexual position do most women prefer? Oh, I definitely want to be okay, on top. Hold on. Okay. It, on top? You want to be the one in control? Is that is that is that, is that a, a top thing? Is that I about wanna, control? What be, is, what's it to about? To be honest with you, I, I, I'm going to just speak for most of the Pisces people in the world. We, we are fish, so we do y- we yin and yang. We swim forward and backwards. So I want to be on top, and then I want to be on bottom. Like I want to be on the top and then with with without disconnecting, flip over like an acrobatic move and then be on the bottom simultaneously without ever losing contact. Can you can you arrange that? Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah. When it comes to this type of thing, I'm pretty sure I can arrange a lot of things. (laughs) Um, So uh, first of all, to let you guys know that the answers come from the Pew Research Center, PEW Research Center. And their actual answers. And the answer for this question is, for which sexual position do most women prefer? Survey says most women do prefer to be on top. And you know why? I believe that it has to do with the anatomy of um, our lady part. Hmm. I I started to say vagina because I can. But then I thought, you know what, Marla, you're getting older. You need to stop with all this shock antic. So Hmm. call it a lady part, girl. You're 50. Hmm. So my lady parts. Because I think when the lady parts, it depends on... When there's the when there's when the there's organ insertion, oh, 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 you like that, right? I do. I'm keeping it <laughs> more than you realize. <laughs> anyway, but go ahead. I think that I think that it depends on how we, how we're made, and I think that that there's probably more sensation and chance of orgasm for most women if the if the um, organ the male organ is going inside the women from like boom and then the, and the, and the okay 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 this is in Sesame Street. The so, for, let me just, the, so let me just say so like. If this is if this is the right. And okay, so the fun part about another really fun part about playing the Mad Love game is it has a question for further discussion. So when you're playing with your friends, really a uh, 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 fun conversation can take place. The further discussion question for this card is, what is your favorite position? And you've already said you you do like to be on top. Is that I, your I favorite li- position? It's not. It's it's not. I like to do. I like to. You know, I'm a very active girl. You hmm. know what I mean? So I like to do. You know. A lot of stuff like you know hmm. yeah i like doing stuff I like to do stuff like i like to be you know i like for it to be sporty nice nice I like sporty we, we, sex we won't get into some of the sporty anecdotes that happened during our relationship in the past i but will anyway. tell one right quick since it is my birthday well hurry up we were in on in a a, a trip to a tropical place and i decided that <laughs> i'd said to dave okay listen he was like what are you doing on the dresser and i said i think i should try and jump from the dresser and land on your member and he was like marla if you don't get down right now we're gonna have issues yeah and that was even before i knew that a penis could break anyway that's been the mad love game you can get your own copy of the mad love game by going to our website www.marlandave.com click on the mad merch tab you'll see the mad love game as well as other merchandise from the marla and dave show we're going to get back to the show david is a thinker I never do anything without thinking about it first. Marla is a feeler. I basically wear my personality on my scene. But when Marla and Dave get together, 
It's like a match dancing with a firecracker. This is the Marla and Dave Radio Show on right. the Universal Broadcast Network. Right before we get uh, uh, back it. to the conversation, we're going to uh, quickly go over the poll questions for this week. Last week's poll question was, <coughs> excuse me, is the current climate of hashtag me too and more affecting the dating game? Your options were yes, hashtag men are nervous, or no, hashtag same game. Nothing has changed. And your answers were it, it pretty balanced. Uh, there are 53% that answered and said, yes, men are nervous. And 47 said, it's pretty much the same thing. You're only nervous if you're a rapist. If you're not, it's the same. Anyway, next, moving on. Um, what's the next week's poll question, Marla? Um, next week's poll question right here on the Marlon Dave Show, which you can find on www.marlondave.com while I get my paper together, <laughs> is um, is uh, which issue is more important to you, gun control or gun control, mental health awareness, or both? Hmm. Your Prioritize. options are exact, exactly that. Hashtag, hashtag gun, gun control, control or hashtag mental health awareness or hashtag both. I thought we were going to say it together. We used to be able to do things in sync. Well, we're, we're one. When you say it, I've said it. Anyway, uh, we're going to get no, no, right back to the conversation uh, with uh, Marlene, Mimi's mom, my mother-in-law, my mother. Mimi's mom. Uh, did I say that? You Marla's did. mom. <laughs> back yeah. to the show. Can you handle the truth? This is modern American dialogue in a mad world from two unique, fresh, transparent perspectives. This is the Marla and Dave Radio Show. Mom. Mother. Marla. Yes. Okay, Mom. Can I just say this? I'm so yes. glad that you're here with me. I just feel comforted because the last live show we had, it was David's parents. And I'm just glad you're here. I'm glad that you you have an expertise. Careful. Shush, shush. We don't need to de-escalate. You, and by the way, if you ever want to become a professional lover, right now you could be on the borderline. You could be an intern. You could be an amateur. But if you want to become a professional lover, you can get their book called Becoming a Professional Lover. Okay? Okay. But in the meantime, back to mental health. <laughs> well, Mamie, I think we stumbled on something um, as, a, as a suggestion. What does it take? To get a suggestion like the one we just had before we went to the break, when we were take, when we were talking about uh, getting a tariff in place uh, on gun manufacturing, the gun manufacturing industry to help fund uh, the mental health uh, uh, facilities that we need in this country that no longer exist, thanks to Ronald Reagan. Well, you you um, you you need to get an interested legislator that has a voice and particularly around the time right around through here around the time of of election of so that their voice could be heard because senator craig deeds is really gonna, i didn't understand you. i said senator craig deeds he's the guy who yeah, who's, somebody who's is going to really listen right in through here hmm and, because, and you know it's just a it's it's a, a known fact now that no matter what signs are demonstrated, nothing will happen until the act is actually committed, and then it's too late. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, all of us that are in this this discussion today are NAMI members, and part of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, part of the job that NAMI actually does is advocacy mm -hmm. at the legislative level, uh, and so that's exactly what we're talking about right now. And it would be a good idea for you to everyone listening to join NAMI and to then take insist that this issue be taken up at the legislative level and to just help reinforce uh, the National Alliance on Mental Illness and everything that they do, as well as uh, Marla and her mom, uh, Marlene, who we're speaking with today, are part of Marla's uh, foundation, Loving Beyond Reason. Right. So, you know, my foundation focus, our foundation focus, as we are in our um, constructive phase, um, with, you know, board members and, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely already filed as a 501C. Um, but as we begin to, to build our organization and, and um, hone our mission, our mission is really uh, focused at minority mental health and all of the, um, all of the cracks offering information and resource to all of the cracks that we've experienced 
dealing with our own mental health crisis with our son. So including inmate services. So, you know, th that's something that DJ is determined to continue when he comes out. And many of you, including my mom, have been instrumental in continuing to give to that. That cause is, is, is a forever cause because right now we're helping the inmates who are really mental health patients because none of these people have committed crimes against humanity, only crimes against themselves. It's basically all misdemeanor things based on a, a mental health meltdown. And they're just ha they happen to be housed in jail. And so they're in need. And one uh, donation can for $30 literally changes the perspective and gives hope to those who are who feel forgotten. They're lost lives. Well, we want to thank you, uh, Mimi, for actually, uh, again, for being a part of the conversation today. Uh, thank you for everything that you do, both for Marla and I, our family, but also for the Mad family in uh, helping us deal with issues and bringing such a wise, informative perspective to these conversations. And, Mom, you know what? I just had my 50th birthday, as you know. I just want to say thank you it, it happy birthday to you. You're the one who actually, you know, birthed me here. I'm still in pain. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make her a pain in the... What? Yeah, I didn't come out of her ass. So just go ahead and she don't just stop it. Uh, well, again, thank you again, Mimi. Th okay, Mom. Thanks, and you know what? We'll look forward to everybody. Will look forward to us continuing. Like I said, thank you for joining um, me on this next phase of life, and and I'm very serious about what we're doing with the foundation and this mission. Um, so when you get when you become unfrozen, then you know you and I will be able to continue to move forward. Right quick, any last words, Mamie? Uh, I think we stumbled on a, on a good idea, and we're going to have to try to champion that on through. Yep. No, I, 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 think, that, I think that's it. Huh? All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Love you. Bye. So I guess from the perspective of either or, uh, mental health aware awareness versus gun control. I think we stumbled on how to combine both into the same thing. And I think that I'm going to leave this on the issue. table as well. And this is another thing that I know will will change gun law. I said this earlier on the phone and on my feed. I know in my heart that if every legalized minority immediately, if we picked a week, a seven day period, that everyone in the United States that was a minority uh, went to the NRA and filled out an application to ha to have a firearm. We would ch the law would change immediately. Or went to purchase an AR-15. But you, just to sign up, I'm telling you, if we all signed up within the week, the flood of that, all being minority, would shut that shiznit all the way down. I'm guaranteeing that it would happen. I'm not sure, especially after speaking David, with, especially after the reason why the I, I say that's not, not the answer is we've talked to law enforcement professionals and more guns is not the answer. No, we, we're not getting the guns just to apply. You don't understand that the, the, the fear of that, the fear of minorities actually legally carrying guns, a whole country full, and because again, most of the guns now on the street are done illegally. They're not registered firearms well the good thing about it is this this is an issue that not only uh, uh we are passionate about uh, a lot uh, the majority of americans are now passionate about and that's a good thing even though i disagree with that perspective uh, it's good to keep the conversation going and the reason why i say that is because another thing that we don't need in a conflict uh, situation when we're trying to resolve conflict is fear I, you don't want a bunch of people who are scared with guns. I'm just talking. I mean, about, that's the I'm one thing you don't about want. about getting the legislation <laughs> changed. I'm just trying to tell you, it would change it. And the reason why I say that is because that just fuels uh, the problem that we have now with uh, racial uh, discrimination and racial but the uh, laws uh, are... segregation and separation versus okay. bringing everybody together. I think that it would work. Um, I think I'm right, and I'll never know because I can't polarize an entire country. Or maybe can I? Maybe you can. It only takes one. Anyway, this is the Marlon Dave Show. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out for the discussion. Thanks to both Daryl Smith and Marlene. I'm gonna. We're gonna be. We're gonna be bringing the Marlon Dave Show to you from on McCraw. location. Um, uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks because we we've got some more travel to do, but we've decided to bring it from our vacation spot. And um, 
what else? Oh, we got some hot shows coming up when we get back too. Indeed. So we, you know, look forward to some special music guests, um, an, another host. We, we, Jason, we're coming for you. Um, we'll make Bluetooth. it happen. Bluetooth. Bluetooth. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, see you next week, the Marlon Dave Show. Thanks for stopping by. Bye.